Hi, this is Pete Lyons of Let's Play Salesforce, and in tonight's Winter 20 release video, we are finally going to be talking about recipes. So yeah, I get it. We're a little late on this one. Well, it happens. Uh, technically, the release is not complete. The remainder of orgs will be getting it uh, this weekend, so it's still pre-release content. Uh, but anyway, we're going to delay one more time. Before we get into recipes, there's a killer new feature on the dashboard designer that you guys have to check out. So we've re uh, we've seen the change of uh, create step to create query. While that is pretty cool, that's not what I'm trying to show you here. Down here, it used to say something about uh, create a uh, static step with custom values or something like that. Now it says create custom query. And again, it's not the labeling. It's the new UI for static steps. So previously, we just had this simple thing where we could update a display column, a label column, and we would name our step. Uh, now we have a completely new UI, and by default, we are only required to have a display column. So uh, normally, if I was going to create a static step to allow for a simple group toggle between like you know, um, account type and uh, opportunity stage, I would do something like this. And then uh, you know I would add a column, and we'll get to those other things here. But I would just go in and I would put in custom text in my column, and uh, the other thing is that this would be named uh, value, and I wouldn't be able to change it around. Now it would auto detect if we input uh, numbers or text, but one really cool thing that we have now is that we do have the ability to fix whether that is number or text. And uh, why you might think that we need this functionality, well, there's this thing called zip codes. So uh, yeah, it's a real thing. We don't have anything for Boolean. I do occasionally pass true-false, uh, but it's not the thing I do most commonly, so I'm pretty happy with these two values. But for Booleans, you would still need to uh, go in and edit the JSON on those. But now when I want to do something as simple as add a third grouping, I no longer have to uh, go and manually edit the JSON to do that. Uh, or if I want to change the order of them, you know, that seems like something I might want to do. Or maybe uh, the client tells me that we want to change the name of uh, what's being displayed because we changed the label of the field but not its API name. Another cool thing, I no longer have to actually think about what my API names are and I don't have to worry about typos because I can just add a column from a dimension or a measure in a given data set and that's going to let me search through data sets and then just pick dimensions that are available to me. So for example, my type field is going to be right here, account underscore type because this is the DTC opportunity data set and uh, I just copied it over to this org. Uh, and then for stage, I would just pick stage. And now I don't have to worry about any typos when I'm creating my static step. I can still go back and I have the same uh, ability to move these around. Once a column is created, we don't have the ability to change its type. We can make it the first column. I don't entirely understand why we would need to do this. Um, you know, if we don't have full move it left and move it right, the, the position of the columns isn't really that important. Uh, but there is one use case where you might actually find uh, the, the column values to be important and that would be if we wanted to use our static steps for simple mockups so that we could show somebody what the look and feel of a dashboard is going to be before we actually construct it. So for example, I could say and then I could add a measure column to this And this would be a really easy way for me to just, uh, you know, spit out some data really quickly that I could put up on a chart. And then I would just hit done on this guy, drag a chart over to here, and say, you know, hey, is this what you want it to look like? Uh, and, you know, this is a great step when we're still just doing early prototyping and worrying about things like data set construction and design and and where is the data even going to be flowing in from uh, but we still want to be able to say this is going to be the look and feel and these are the sort of insights that we need to gather and that's going to help us answer some of those um, architectural questions while we're still in a prototyping phase so I did say we'd get into recipes and recipe getting into we shall uh, I will probably try to do something a little bit more exhaustive on the recipe builder in the future uh, but I'm mostly going to be focusing on the new functionality that we're seeing in winter 20 um, 
I to, historically uh, haven't really used the recipe builder a whole lot. I check out what's available. Uh, I think it has a lot of cool potential, but there's some things about it that just didn't really work right for me um, in the past. But some of this net new functionality that we're seeing in the recipe builder that doesn't that does not appear in the data flow designer is actually really really compelling, um, and I'm very excited to see what they do about it in the future. The first new feature that we're seeing uh, is this ability to fill in gaps. So I have all of this zip code data here, but sometimes I may or may not have the state. If I select a column where the system feels that it's capable of predicting missing values based off a correlating column, it'll try to fill those in for us. Uh, so then we would pick the column that, we, that uh, we believe has the correlation, we would select add, and now it's actually running its prediction. And if you know anything about zip codes, you know that every zip code that starts with one zero is in the state of New York, while every zip code that starts with nine zero is in the state of California. So this would actually be an ideal data set to you know test this out with and say like, oh, do, is it doing the right job? Now, if it's something significantly more complex, I would take that with a grain of salt. But for something as simple as this uh, data quality exercise, I can't tell you how many times I have uh, implemented my state scrubber, which can go through uh, full addresses like a wood chipper and strip out the state value from that. And these sort of repetitive data cleansing operations can be made a lot easier with this feature. Uh, I don't actually know how long it takes to fill in the TBD, but I did get a demo of this from Salesforce, and uh, it's a very compelling feature, uh, and I'm looking to test it out with my clients in the future. So the next feature we're looking at is, again, related to data quality and data cleanup. And on the one hand, I think that the fill functionality is is kind of more impressive than what this does because of, of how it has to do what it does. Um, but I think that this is a feature that if your stakeholders are very resistant of anything, you know, where the machine is taking a little too much liberty with the decision, uh, then you're probably going to like this feature uh, a little bit better. But honestly, I think they're both awesome. Um, if we click here and format our dates, now I can enter some uh, different date formats that I have in my data, tell it how I want them cleaned up and it'll do the work for me. So let's give this a spin. Oh, that's pretty cool. It actually recognizes this as an invalid format because the Ds are capitalized. One other thing to call out is you do actually, it says, you know, that it's gotta be, uh, separated by tabs, but really to get to the next box, you actually just have to click into here, and that's what's going to make it pop up. Uh, then we can specify the format that we want to convert this to. So I'm going to go with Salesforce standard. And I do also have uh, this checkbox to convert the field uh, to the type of date. So I actually ended up with two different versions of this. I'm not a million percent sure uh, why they're behaving differently. Uh, I think I might have accidentally skipped the uh, option for this one. Uh, so again, I I'm just using this for the first time. I'm not a million percent sure how it works. But right off the bat, I I'm definitely seeing some improved results. If nothing else, I'm seeing consistency, which is po probably the most important thing to me. Like, however you're going to format your dates, I really don't care what your preference is. They're all valid. Uh, just make sure that it is consistent. Uh, if you can do this in the source system, great. If not, now you can do it with the recipe builder. So the next feature we're going to cover is aggregation. This is something I kind of covered in my uh, video Roll Up Anything from my first Dataflow Basics series. And this is going to allow us to create an aggregate data set. So what we're looking at here is transactions over time at different branches. So I can either hit the group bunk or the aggregation button up here, or I can select the column that I want to aggregate on. Uh, the advantage of doing it from the column is that it already selects the branch for us. We have the addition to add, or the ability to add additional groupings. So if you have a highly transactional data set with lots and lots of rows coming in in a month, and you want to get insights into things like how many, uh, you know, what's my total transaction volume, what's my average transaction volume, or, or just how many transactions did I have. Uh, that's the, the, the sort of things that you would want to do aggregation for. So for example, if I just do, you know, count of rows, we can see that everything's got 36 rows and then we can do like average of amount and we can do like sum of amount 
And these are going to come through a little bit ugly. Uh, but we can go ahead and then do further modification to those. This is pre-existing functionality. Uh, so for example, I'm going to use the truncate feature on this. I want uh, penny precision, so I'm going to put a comma 2 right there. I'm going to do that, and I'll probably do the same thing on this sum of amount formula here. So uh, this time I'll just type it in myself, or nope, yep, the button still works. That's pretty cool. Now we're going to put in a comma 2 right here. Hit add. Okay, now I got some new columns. Well, I probably don't want to keep these ugly columns that I just used for uh, processing, but uh, when I go to create my data set, I will be able to remove those sources. I'm not going to lie. I have no idea how I'm supposed to change these column names. Uh, I tried a few times. I tried re-recording, thinking maybe I'd figure it out as I went along. Nope, can't figure it out for the life of me. I have no idea how to change these column names. I just don't recipe enough, I guess. Uh, so, you know, I would hit continue, whatever. Uh, and uh, right now, I'm not going to... Uh, schedule this is or anything but it is uh, saved now this actually rolls us forward into our next feature really well so the kind of insights that I want to actually get off of this are gonna be things like how does this particular transaction compare to my average transaction is it higher or lower or what so in order to do that I would take this data set and I would join it on the right hand side and push it back down through the data flow editor. Now we're getting into this whole thing where we got two different systems governing one data set and we're gonna end up with data duplication. It's it's no bueno. But we now have a feature that uh, just like everything else I've shown you tonight is not explicitly available out of the box in analytics data flows. This is something that I have covered in advanced data modeling. Uh, I have saved the best to last and I would love to one day be able to tell you that those videos are obsolete because standard out of the box functionality is gonna get us there. But uh, what I can do now with just the recipe builder is I can select that same data set that uh, we're working off of, this monthly data set. And I got all these new buttons right up here. So I can right join on and I can add in and now I've got my individual row level detail for this data set that I started with along with those aggregates that I just created. So from here I can go on to further add in uh, those additional columns that we had uh, taken from before. I can get rid of these ones that we don't necessarily really care about and I can hide all the fields that I don't really need. Still no idea how to change that column name. But uh, what this is going to give us is that aggregate data set. So now I can do comparisons by saying like okay so this is my average and this is my this, that, and the other, and uh, I can actually do those kind of row level comparisons. Probably should have kept that row in here because I'm going to need to uh, do a little bit of math with it. I'm not going to take this all the way through, but uh, you know, again, this is the killer application, uh, the absolute gem of the Winter 20 release that we now finally have this uh, very, very robust join support. This is going on the thumbnail. So if you enjoyed this video, uh, please like, subscribe, tell a friend, and as always, thanks for watching.